Chair, present. Patricia Trout, Chair. Present. Okay. We have a quorum. Okay. Um, so um, I just wanted to um, welcome everyone to the meeting today. And um, Happy New Year. I hope this is a, a good and productive year for all of us. Um, let's see. So uh, we will take our lunch break at 12, or, excuse me, at 11.20 and that's for 30 minutes. So now is um, an opportunity to review the agenda and to re rearrange any agenda items that anyone would like. Okay, very good. Then we'll just keep the agenda as is. Uh, let's see, I'd like to ask uh, members of the public if they'd like to introduce themselves. It's volunteering. Hi, my name is Dustin Maxim, and I'm a registered landscape architect in the state of Nevada, and I'm here to speak to you on a couple of different agenda topics today. Hi, I'm Sean Rohrbacher, also a registered landscape architect in the state of Nevada, working in California, and I'm working with Dustin as well to speak on a few topics today. Hi, I'm Barton Schmidt, a landscape architect from San Diego, came up to observe the proceedings. Thanks. Oops, sorry. Tracy Morgan Hollingworth. I'm the executive director of the California Council of the American Society of Landscape Architects and also the San Diego chapter of ASLA. Uh, Jim Schubert. I'm a registered landscape architect from Sacramento area. I work for the Department of Transportation in Sacramento County. Okay, thank you and welcome. Okay. Uh, let's see, so that was agenda item C, then we'll move to D. Um, let's see, can I have a motion to approve the November 4th meeting minutes? So moved. No second bell. Can you do the roll? Yes, I will. Two questions to call for any public comment on the oh, okay. on motion. Okay. okay. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, any public comment on the meeting minutes from November 4th? Okay. Do we need to restate the motion? Oh, thanks. Okay. Just as long as your staff's clear. Okay. Ready for roll? Roll? Yes, sir. Andrew Bowden? Aye. Mark Trosca? Aye. Patricia Trout? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, so let's see. We'll have the uh, program manager's report on administration, examination, licensing, and enforcement. Patrick? Thank you. <coughs> Um, some of the things in the program manager report have been talked about before, so I'm just going to hit the highlights of the new things. Um, every year, the, the each board and bureau puts out an annual report. And we have we submitted our final annual report on nine, on November 30th, 2016, and that report includes a summary of regulations, major studies, any new program developments that were submitted by the RETC and all the final data on summaries of licensing and enforcement activities. Um, we are continuing with our workaround system. The brief project is uh, still in the, in the works. We hope to be transitioned to the brief project starting in 2017. As far as our budget goes, um, as you know, we did do a reduction in renewal fees for the last renewal cycle because we had too much money in our budget. We had a little over 27 months in reserve. So for the one renewal cycle that we anticipate would bring our levels down to the appropriate amount, um, we still find that we are in excess of 20 months in reserve in our budget. So we are proposing that the uh, renewal, license renewal fees be continued, the reduction renewal fees be continued through 
um, June 30th, 2019. That rulemaking file is, has gone all the way through the process and is now with the Department of Consumer Affairs getting all the signatures it has to have, have before it's submitted to the Office of Administrative Law. <clears throat> we will ask that the regulations take effect July 1st, 2017. So we're well along the way with that one. Uh, the California Architects Board met December 15th and 16th in Sacramento and also did their strategic plan at that time. Um, Mr. McCauley noted at that meeting that the board considered a number of enforcement issues such as enhancing the written contract requirements and updating citation regulations. Personnel, as you know, Trish Rodriguez has accepted the job with the uh, uh, Board of Pharmacy and I'm filling in for her. So this is a first for me in many, many years. <laughs> um, we, have, we have started recruitment efforts. We do have applications and we hope to begin the, the interview process in mid to late February and hire somebody by March, April at the earliest. And same with our enforcement analyst position. We are also gearing up to start interviews on that as well. Uh, regulatory amendments, reciprocity requirements. We, that package is in the works and we are, that's a separate agenda item today so I'm not going to discuss it here. Uh, our regulation that allows Credit for teaching under um, credit for teaching took effect January 1st, 2017. So uh, people who want to get one year, they can get one year of experience for teaching in an accredited or approved program. And I also believe that an extension certificate program. Um, the next regulation we have going is. California Code of Regulations 2620.5, requirements for an approved extension certificate program. That's also another agenda item today, so we'll be talking about that a little bit later in the meeting. As I mentioned before, our fee regulations should take effect by July 1st, 2017. Um, our disciplinary guideline regulations that have been in progress for quite some time now the, the board approved rec, um, amendments to the regulations at their meeting in November. No. The REC considered them in November, and the board approved uh, proposed regulatory language at this, on December 15, 2016. And so staff is now taking those same amendments and modifying them to be appropriate for the LAPC, and those revisions will be presented to the LAPC at a future meeting. Um, strategic plan objectives, some of them are ongoing, creating and disseminating a consumer guide. We are almost through with that. Hopefully that will be completed at the next uh, future meeting. Um, expanding credit for education experience to include degrees in related areas of study. We are going to be discussing that later on today. Expired license requirements, we have initiated the process of um, aligning our requirements with the boards so that uh, that's going to require that we've repealed Business and Professions Code section 5680.1 and point two, and I believe that will be in the legislation next year, possibly. Yes. Once the legislation is passed to repeal those two sections, we will then go forward with proposing regulations to repeal the ones that exist right now that outline what happens when your license has been expired for five years or from three to five years. So that's all coming up in the future. Training, uh, Stacy will be attending rulemaking training in February. We continue to update our website. Uh, the LAIR was administered December 5th to the 17th and examination results should be released by mid to late January. California Supplemental Examination, we have completed the workshops that uh, from 2016, the last workshop was held in December, and all the, item right, the items that were prepared during those workshops will be incorporated into the CSE, they've been added to the item bank, and they'll start being added to the exam and tested for um, legitimacy in September of 2017. And that concludes my report. Any, any comments?
move on here to um, agenda item F, and that's uh, Council of Landscape Architectural Registration Board part. And uh, Gretchen, do you want to? Yes, I, as I just mentioned, the mayor was administered in uh, December, and the results should be out in late um, January. The next exam, the next letter administration is in March. I believe the final filing date for that will be February 10th. So if you know anybody who wants to take the exam, they need to have their application to us by February 10th. And that's all we need to do on this agenda item today. Okay. Um, agenda item G. Address some possible action on strategic plan objectives. Okay. This is a this has been a strategic plan item for quite some time. Sorry to interrupt. I think uh, did we address item F with five? Yes. Good. There was um we need to ratify. Yeah, there's a need to ratify we have a form, I'm sorry, a formal motion for that in the budget. Which, which action are you? I'm, uh, I guess um, the second part of F. Right. So normally would, you would, although I think Patricia had an additional prompt to share on that. Yeah. So um, um, I was considering uh, being um, nominated and I have um, reconsidered and I think that um, I want to um, discontinue that. Um, basically, I, you know, I think it would be uh, something that I'm interested in doing in the future, but not at this time. Okay. Has it already been submitted to CARB? It has, so we will have to we'll address let that. them know. Uh, let's see. Okay, then um, agenda item G. This is a um, this is a subject that the Landscape Architects Committee has been. Uh, it was part of the strategic plan for the last session, and I'm not sure if it was part of the strategic plan before that. But it, the, uh, the the topic itself is to expand credit for education experience that creates degree that allows degrees in areas of study other than strictly landscape architecture. So it's bringing forth the idea of accepting um, related degrees. There's quite a bit of history here. Um, I know you've all read it. But as we go through it, um, three issues, actually two of these issues are, are kind of going hand in hand, reciprocity and accepting alternate degrees. And prior to Prior to January 1st, 1997, CCR, California Code of Regulations 2620, included a provision that would grant credit for any bachelor's or associate's degree towards the six year required, you have to have six years education and training in landscape architecture. So prior to January 1st, 1997, any baccalaureate degree was accepted, as was, was allowed to grant a specific amount of credit towards the six years. Um, at that time, you could also qualify for the licensing examination on the basis of experience only, six years of training experience. And also at that time, um, you could get one year of training credit under, you know, I'm just going to read this because it's kind of complicated. So do you mind if I just do that? I, I hate to paraphrase, it, paraphrase and, and miss something. So prior to January 1st, CCR section 20, 2620, had the provision to grant credit for any bachelor's and associate's degree towards the six year required six years of training experience. It allowed eligibility to applicants with six years training and of training experience under the direct supervision of a licensed landscape architect in lieu of requiring education. And it also granted up to one year of training credit for experience as or under the supervision of a licensed architect, registered civil engineer, licensed landscape contractor. Or, or certified nursery person. In March of 1994, the former board began discussing the possibility of increasing the maximum amount of credit 
allowed for experience with the licensed landscape contractor. The board, the BLA, reviewed 2620 and determined that in order to grant additional credit for landscape contractor experience, the education requirement should be changed. They began that process in 1994, it took quite some time to get it through, but on January 1st, 1997, the laws and regulations were changed to require all applicants to either hold a degree or a degree or an approved extension certificate in landscape architecture to sit for the licensing exam. Um, what follows is uh, what follows in writing there is, is what happened during the 2004 to 2007 when the requirements changed. The education subcommittee. Um, talked about accepting other related degrees during that period of time and came up with allowing architecture, a degree from an accredited architecture program to count for one year of experience. But that was the only degree that they decided to accept would be, would, would be appropriate for landscape architecture. So over the past several years, um, the many, many, many states accept related degrees Many states require just a bachelor's degree, and if you have a bachelor's degree in any subject, you have to have more years of experience. If you have a landscape architecture degree, you have to have fewer years of experience. Most states have a certain year requirement, anywhere from um, four to 12 years, some states, but the average is probably six to eight. So we fall right in with the average of six to eight. But where we differ is that we only allow degrees in landscape architects architecture and architecture. Um, we have received applications for reciprocity from people with degrees in urban design, environmental planning, city planning, um, many, many, many degrees. People that are licensed in other states, they come here, they can't get reciprocity because they don't have a degree in landscape architecture. So uh, the, the issue is resurfacing now. Staff has done a lot of work on the number of states that allow related degrees, the number of states that allow any bachelor's degrees, what the combined years of experience and education are, and so it's a subject that the LA, that's being brought before the LAPC today to decide if we want to expand um, pathways to licensure by opening it up to either related degrees, any degree, um, and just starting the discussion. Okay. Let's um let's open open this up for discussion. I guess the, the first um, uh, question that I have is um, the the impetus for um, restricting it to an architecture or a landscape architecture degree. So um, can you give us a little more history on that? Um, you know, I was here when that happened, but that was a long time ago. And there are a couple things that stick out in my mind. One it was the um, allowing landscape contractors experience to be gained under a landscape contractor, so there may have been some give and take there. There was major discussion on curriculums that are similar to landscape architecture and that they include critical thinking and technical aspects of contracting and uh, the more scientific as aspects of landscape architecture and art and design. Um, for whatever reason, they got, I think the pass rate was extremely low then and the, the LATC had concerns about and the board had concerns about the pass rate and you know, maybe people can't pass the exam if they have a degree in horticulture as opposed to landscape architecture. Maybe they haven't gotten the great, the grading and drainage and all of the technical skills that you have to have. So those are the things that stick in my mind. But um, I, I, that's about all I, I can offer other than what the ed, education subcommittee came up with. So, um, Just to add a little bit, I. I was here as well, but it was a long time ago. But in, in going back through some of the material, I looked at the original charge for the education subcommittee, and uh, it was twofold. One issue was to 
to make sure our standards are appropriate to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. And that's obviously the paramount concern in everything that we do. The Practice Act says it two or three different ways in terms of our, our charge and our statutory mandate. The other half of the charge for the subcommittee was making sure that whatever the standards are, that they successfully prepare applicants for the exam. I don't think that's really the purpose of education or really under the preview of a licensing board. It's our role to make sure that our standards are appropriate and make sure that our exam is a, a valid measure of the candidate's competence. How they get to that standard isn't necessarily our thing. The other piece is our world has changed quite a bit since 2004 um, in terms of the view of occupational licensing, both at the national level and the state level. There's actually a, a White House report on occupational licensing, and one of the major themes is looking at the standards for education and experience and determining whether or not they're appropriate or they represent a barrier that could be problematic. And then similarly, at the state level, there's a report from what's called the Little Hoover Commission, and it delves into some of the same issues and, and more. But again, it, it underscores um, the importance of looking at your standards and the role they play in the marketplace. The overarching concern is maybe licensure, not necessarily in this profession, but across the board within our marketplace. Maybe it's gone a little bit too far, and we want to ensure that we have reasonable standards and also reasonable portability among the states. So I wanted to give that kind of broad color commentary in terms of how um, both at the state level and the national level, licensure is currently being viewed. Don, Don what, what does the uh, California Architects Board do in terms of reciprocity? The, the core issue is um, obviously that you hold a license in another state and then that you take and pass the California Supplemental Examination. So an architect who is licensed in Nevada or Arizona can apply and I believe the NCARB documentation is trigger or not. We accept the NCARB certificate as well. So if they're, if they're licensed in Nevada and they want reciprocity, they apply, they sit for the California supplemental exam, if they pass it, then they're eligible to receive their license. Correct? There are probably some other nuances that Vicki okay. knows better than I, but <laughs> in terms of generally meeting our right. total of eight years, five <laughs> education or experience, and then uh, the structured internship program if you're subject to that requirement. That's right. And we have the, um, the internship program, so if they've already completed that, then that's way, but if they haven't and they're licensed in the other state, then I believe they have to have three years post licensure experience, so there is that component of it also. Um, they can also come to us with verification of eight years of experience in pre or post licensure through work experience or a combination. So there's different levels, different options for them to come to us through. Okay. So there's a, the internship program, <coughs> but as far as education, there's there's no requirement? Well, we allow for initial licensure, we allow experience only if they've had eight years. So you know, that is a different path for us as opposed to the OTC. Right. So do they count the, um, you know, if they have a degree? in architecture, does that count towards their experience? Um, oh, yes, absolutely, okay. The difference for us, we, we've talked about internship, I wanna be sure that everybody understands. We mean internship with a capital I. The program is now, now called the Architectural Experience Program, and it's quite robust and prescriptive, and it says you have to attain a specified number of hours of work experience in these different practice areas. And so the way I view it, it's kind of the equalizer. So if you have experience only, no degree, an associate degree, or a degree from Harvard, it ensures that those folks receive the same type of experience coming into the profession, no matter what their educational background might be. Well, you know, I, I come from a time when I, when I got my license in 1979, where we did have that, um, you know, the degree was not required, that there was a pathway for experience only. And um, I have to, re I, I'm remembering back to the time when I first heard that we had done away with that. When it was, the, I think it was the Board of Landscape Architects that did away with that. Was that correct? Correct. Yeah. So, 
and I was uh, I was on the enforcement committee for the ELA at, at that time, uh, but I was not on the board, so I didn't have a vote in that or say in that. And, uh, I was a little surprised at that because we had people in our own office who were trying to take that pathway, and suddenly it was closed. So um, I'm not. I, I wouldn't necessarily object to that necessarily, as long as we're, as we could be assured that there still are provisions that are going to help protect the health, safety, and welfare. Now, I know there's going to be those who are going to argue that the test is the gatekeeper of that, and, and I would tend to agree. But I still think that education is important. Uh, how this all relates, I'm not really too sure just yet. Uh, I'd like to hear some further discussion about it. But as far as taking a look at uh, additional degrees, um, I can think of several individuals, one in particular who was a trustee for the San Diego chapter, who um, was, he's an outstanding landscape architect, uh, but he does not have a degree in landscape architecture. He has a degree in, in environmental sciences or something like that. And under the provisions today, he, you know, if he was to, to um, try to submit himself for licensure in California today, he would be eligible. So um, I think that, that we need to take a look at these additional degrees. I don't know if we want to necessarily say any degree or if we somehow get it so that there's you know, earth science degrees and that we try to encapsulate what those are, but those may be hard to define. Uh, I mean, there's new degree programs all the time that come up and and we, we might miss one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyway, I, that, that's all I want to say at this particular moment. Yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead. Um, one thing that concerns me is last year, when I was teaching at UC Davis, um, my senior level cohort, there are 30, 30, 30, 31, and half of them were not United States citizens. And that's something that, uh, in the education landscape architecture, we're seeing more and more. And that's not, it isn't the norm that over half is, but, um, and what concerns me about that is the fact that uh, we're educating a lot of people, quality people, qualified people, but in a lot of cases, I'm guessing because of their work, um, you know, legally how they can work in the United States or not, they'll be leaving the United States. So we're, Diminishing our pool of potential landscape architects, and that's a concern of mine. That um, that we have a lot of different forces for a lot of different reasons that are minimizing the number of candidates set for landscape architect uh, landscape architects license. And the, I'm I'm one of those who believe that that the test is the gate to get into becoming a landscape architect. And um, I firmly believe that an education in landscape architecture is the best way to create quality, really good landscape architects. But I don't think it's the only way, personally. And I think that, that we need to have other opportunities for those to get into our profession, to sit for the licensing exam that measures basic competency, and um, so they can become landscape architects. I think, I believe that there are quality contractors and designers and others who would take the exam and pass it and that they should have the right to be a licensed landscape architect. That's my belief. Um, so I'm interested in one, aligning with the architects board more and more of our regulation uh, so that we're much more in line with how they're administering licensure to architects. I'm also very interested in exploring opportunities to break down barriers for those who can sit for the exam so they can become licensed. Because at the end of the day, they have to pass a very difficult set of tests to become a landscape architect. That's my opinion. I'd like to just throw in a comment here along those lines. Um, if you look at the, the test results that have come out over the past couple of years, I went through them last night, the uh, California lags behind in pass rates. So here we require a landscape architect's degree, but our pass rate for sections three and four of the layer are consistently below the national average. So. 
Well, we've discussed that many times at many LETC meetings in the past. And one of the concerns that I could see somebody might have is by doing, having it a, a experience only, would that even have an even bigger impact on the pass rates? Um, well, if you look at the, the rates of, or the number of states that allow alternate pathways, it's the last paragraph in your narrative there. 31 states grant educational accredited for, for accredited engineering degrees. 28 grant educational credit for any bachelor's degree. Um, we have a, uh, Courtney did an extensive amount of work comparing and contrasting other states. And the numbers are, um, if you look at the attachment, the last attachment under this item. Are you going to go to the next? It's the very a chart. Yeah, it's the very last chart. chart. It's attachment B3. <coughs> it shows, it reflects the number of states that allow architecture, engineering, any bachelor's degree. And it's, it's a substantial number of states. So you have to assume that those people are testing and. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, to that point, though, and, and, and this is information that we've always requested, but we, but we can't get because Clark won't release it. And that is, how does uh, you know those those states? What are their pass rates like? And we, we can't get that, so we don't know that that their system is better than ours, or that their test results are better than ours, or it's similar or worse than ours. Um, but it is interesting to note that there are 29, and this. Apparently, also includes Alberta, in Canada. Uh, there's 29 that, uh, states that will re that will accept any degree, even non-accredited degrees. Um, but it's also interesting to note that there are 23 states that will not accept any, just any degree. So um, you know, it's like kind of half and half, mm -hmm. not not quite half and half, but almost. So. Um, we don't want to overregulate, obviously. Mm -hmm. and, and Mark, to your to your mm -hmm. point, I, I totally agree. I mean, we don't want to be exclusionary. We want to be inclusionary. We want to bring people into the profession. We're not trying to set up barriers, but our purpose is to protect the health, safety, and welfare. So now, whether it can be argued that <coughs> education is an integral part of that is is really part of that discussion because we only require one year of education. Mm -hmm. How you obtain that one year. Is, is really the key, and that, that tends to be a little bit of a problem. Um, so, <clears throat> now, when we get to the reciprocity discussion, there'll be a whole different discussion point on that. But when we're talking about initial licensure, I still think that, that, that education is very important. And so our current, rate, our, our current requirement, requiring a minimum of one year, of education is still um, important to to do in licensure in California for initial mm -hmm. in landscape architecture alone. No, or no, architecture? no. Okay. I'm just saying in education. Okay, now how you obtain that education is now the discussion is: Are we going to grant credit for degrees that are outside of landscape architecture and architecture? I was actually a little surprised when I heard that. Our education subcommittee did not feel that a degree in engineering was was comparable. I was a little surprised at that, but on the other hand, they were looking at information that we don't necessarily have, and that is that they're not accredited uh, degrees. Right. I guess uh, I may not be saying that quite correctly, but so it's kind of like comparing apples and oranges. So a school of engineering does not have to go through a accreditation. Process at the time. Apparently, I, wow. I don't know if that's true, true or not. But apparently, our education subcommittee felt that, that for whatever reason there was not enough parity between 
what a civil engineer does or what they learn in school uh, in their education and what, what is learned in landscape architecture or architecture, that there's not enough equality there. Uh, I don't know enough about, you know, what is taught in the, in the School of Engineering to be able to be able to respond to that. But, um, I, but I was surprised when I heard that, that we were not giving credit to civil engineering. Okay, a few things for me. One, the good news and the bad news for LATC being under the board is it means we always need to be mindful of what the board's standards and take a look at those. And as we've discussed, the board has an experience-only pathway. And when I first came to the board, I was surprised that there was an experience-only pathway and a degree wasn't required. But as I've learned more about licensure, public protection, exams, and how they work, I'm, I'm much more comfortable with it because ultimately experience and education um, are the means through which you acquire knowledge and cultivate your skills. But in terms of determining whether or not you're in a position to be able to practice safely, that's the function of the exam. That's where the public protection actually um, takes place. Also, when you look at pass rates, the way a psychometrician, an exam geek, would explain it is, they're a reflection of how prepared a particular pool of candidates was to take the exam. So when you compare California and all the different types of diversity we have, um, a candidate, your average candidate in California, is going to be very different than a candidate in a small state that has one accredited school of landscape architecture, and all the big firms literally take the graduates by their hand and walk them through the licensure process. So I think it's to be expected that the pass rates are going to be a little bit different. And then lastly, and this is totally non-scientific, and I reserve the right to change <laughs> the numbers in my opinion, and I, I just looked at a small snippet of enforcement data for the architect board, and in terms of um, citations issued against individuals who hold a degree versus those that don't, there really wasn't a measurable difference in the, the number of actions taken against folks without degrees. It could be, well, I don't know how else we'd measure that, we could dig deeper, but anyway, that's an interesting anecdote, if nothing else, and again, non-scientific. Maybe Rebecca can come up with more disclaimers for me. <laughs> uh, well, this is this has been a um, a good discussion. Um, you know, I I have to agree that I think um, you know having um, the experience, um, you know, whether it's it's a, a formalized type of experience or whether it's more kind of you know on the job. I think. Um, the, the experiences that you have are of what really um, create a situation where you can pass the exam. I, I do kind of feel like the exam is kind of the, the leveling the, um, playing ground. So, um, you know, we can continue to discuss this. We can um, table it or we could have some, um, have a motion. Public comment. You can always call for that. You also would call for it at any point that there's a motion on the floor, then public comment would be requested as well. Okay, so uh, is this is this something strategic planning? Can we get into it in greater depth and have more open public comment in strategic planning? For for the you're education. You're not typically taking public. You're not typically taking public comment on your, your strategic planning because you're just discussing goals or. Okay. But we we do receive public comment, it's an open public process. Something I'd suggest if, uh, I'm not hearing that the committee necessarily is in a position to really drill down and make an official decision on this for perpetuity today. So an option would be, yes, we could talk about it more and help frame the issue tomorrow, but we would want to consider holding a special public workshop where we could gather further input. There's a number of different ways we could approach it, but you know, because of the magnitude of the issue, there might be some value in finding other ways for, for public participation from all the different constituencies, educators, et cetera, students. That sounds appropriate. So um, so we will be tabling um, this agenda item until... Um, well, I think... Okay. I, okay, if you were to table it, you would vote to table it, and okay. in that case, then there'd be a motion on the floor and you could get public comment, or okay. you could take public comment now, since I think it's being expressed that okay. there might be some desire for that. Um, yeah. Or you can make any other sort of motions as well. Okay. 
Well, let's let's uh, go for some public comment. Hi, again, my name is Dustin Maxim, and I'm a registered landscape architect in Nevada, and I live and work primarily in California. Um, I have a degree in geography from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and unfortunately, I did not know landscape architecture existed when I was in college. Um, and I just, I would like to mention that I spoke to you last February in San Diego about this very issue, and um, I just wanted to reiterate that we live in a society where it's simply not possible financially or otherwise for all individuals to earn a degree, extension certificate, a master's degree in um, you know, the proper subject. And so um, I do think it's appropriate for you to consider looking at related degrees. Um, as sort of an outsider in this industry, I've had to work twice as hard to prove myself to employers. Uh, I've had to work twice as hard to get jobs. And I would say that when I took the lair, I found it to be pretty easy. I, I didn't find that to be um, you know, this big hurdle that I'd heard about. And I think the reason that I found it to be easy was because of my background. I have a varied background. I have you know, urban planning, environmental sciences, spatial analysis. I've worked in engineering. And so all this kind of led to this moment. And when I took the lair, you know, I, I breezed through. Um, and I did the hand-drawn version. And I had no problem. Um, so I, I would like to say that the current system inherently has barriers to entry into the profession. And there's sort of a caste system where you're a designer or you're a landscape architect. And one of my motivations for getting licensed in Nevada was to break through that caste system, to at least be able to use the title in the office. Because I could prove to, to my coworkers that I am indeed a landscape architect and I've worked that hard. Um, and I would say that the current system leads to sort of unfair competition. Um, people who aren't necessarily that talented have more opportunities than me because they made one choice, because they knew something I didn't know, you know, way back. And, um, and, I, and I understand, um, you know, your trepidation with the subject, and it's going to be really difficult to select related degrees because, like you said, there's always going to be this, this one extra, this new program or whatever. And so I'm not sure how you could ever solve that problem. Um, I think you, know, you might have to look at a situation where you could evaluate some, a candidate on, on their whatever education to meet the criteria. But then I, I, I suppose that leaves you open to you know, interpretation. Um, so, you know... I guess what I'm trying to say is you may have to look at sort of the blanket, all bachelor's degrees. I don't know how else you could apply this criteria. Um, but I mean, I would, I would like to see related degrees added. I think there's quite a few that make sense. I mean, uh, geography, uh, uh, natural resources, environmental sciences, urban planning, um, even interior design makes sense to me. Um, I've known some amazing designers that were interior designers who moved into the profession. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is there's a lot more to this puzzle, and I think that adding related degrees is an excellent step in the right direction. And I also agree with Doug that um, we should have a public forum where we can have discussion and maybe kind of talk about what constitutes a related degree. Um, and I would like to see that uh, for a lot of these issues that affect a lot of individuals, especially um, regarding education. So I would say that this is, is still another item that's like a long time coming, and I would like to see more movement more quickly. Um, and I don't know if it's possible to to sort of work on something at the strategic planning session, but other than what happens in these meetings and what happens at strategic planning 
I'm still unclear of the process of how, you know, an amendment to the code actually gets crafted. Is it staff and then does the work and then brings it to you? I'm, or and how is the public involved? Um, so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that as well. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, can, I can speak a little bit as to process and when I get into the nuances of uh, the formal rulemaking process, Rebecca will probably um, correct me when I go awry. Um, in terms of our process, you've commented at a number of meetings, all of our meetings are open and public. Um, for the Landscape Architect Technical Committee, we were previously, as most of you know, a separate independent board, Board of Landscape Architecture back in the 90s. Um, now LATC is under the California Architects Board. There are only two functions that have been um, identified by the legislature as areas where LATC can't independently take action, where those decisions need to be voted upon at the board, and those are disciplinary actions and the adoption of regulations. So whatever public comment, gathering, deliberation, et cetera, um, we do here, um, a similar public process would be taking place with the board as well once an issue is fully um, solidified. From there, the formal Administrative Procedure Act rulemaking process begins, which involves a number of very prescriptive steps. Um, the public notice of the regulation, so it's out there and available, a formal public comment period, um, responding to those comments in the rulemaking file, and ultimately um, the regulation being submitted to the department, and then ultimately um, to the Department of Finance as well, and then from there to the Office of Administrative Law. And I'm sure I've over streamlined and skip a couple of steps, yeah. but as you can imagine, a number of those components, particularly once it goes outside of, of our little office, um, what goes on with the department's legal office, regulatory review office, there are separate entities just within the, the department that review it. Um, we really don't have direct control over those. It's not as though I have a stamp on my desk and I can say, okay, regulations approved. No, um, but the good news for the public is that affords additional opportunities for public participation and, and review. And so generally when we're asked, whether it's by the public or our board, how long it takes to codify regulations, it, a year is assuming that everything goes perfect and right. Generally 18 months plus. It just depends how much public comment we receive and how smooth the approval process is. I understand that. And, and the length of that process is, is what brings me on the concern. What, what I'm wondering is, is it possible for the committee to direct staff to sort of craft um, regulatory language to bring back to you at the next meeting that you can discuss? Because just to table it and put it to the next meeting, nothing ever gets done. Because a year ago, I talked about this exact same subject. And this, and this is just um, you know part of my frustration with, with this and the next agenda item, is just that um, if we are, if we do want to streamline it, can you, is there a way for the committee to direct staff to prepare something for you to review, possibly change and vote on for next time? Otherwise, if we just table it to discuss it on a time, we just continue the same cycle. Um, if you did want staff to draft something, you kind of need to know the direction you want to go before we start spending time developing the language. But once you tell us the direction, then for us to come up with the language, we can take that long. So that's exactly what the board does right. to and the committee. They direct staff to craft the language, and that's the language that you saw in the reciprocity um, uh, that we'll be talking about. You know, that that's exactly what happened, and then the public comments came out, and so now you have the whole new. Well, that discussion began in 2012. Right. So that's five time. years ago. But so, I think for having a public forum, yeah. um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking we're, we're going to be getting input from educators and other states, um, what they find with people who have degrees that aren't related at all to landscape architecture, how, you know, how do they fare. I think there's a lot more input that we could get on opening this up to related degrees as opposed to all degrees. Um, What's going to be the proper ratio if you have a degree in geography? How many years of experience do you need to balance those out? Whereas if you had a degree in landscape architecture, you get four years, then you need two years of experience. So I'd be happy with a related degree equaling the one year minimum. I mean, that would, 
See, those are the that issues that we'll we'll be discussing once we get a feel for which, you know, what works, what's going to protect the public, um, what will open pathways to licensure. Then you can direct staff to say, okay, cross I'm just the looking for ways to speed, speed up. up the process because I need to be here in five years still talking about this. Thing. Right. Yeah. Well, in all due respect uh, to what you're saying, and I can certainly understand the frustration and length of time, however, we're the ones that have to make the decision and go on record as saying this is the way the regulation is going to be. You may have that opinion that a related degree is fine, but somebody else may have a different degree, a different opinion. And we have to take that into consideration equally as well. And they may not be sitting here in this room today. Yeah. So a question might be, you know, does a degree in English carry the same amount of weight as a degree in geography in, in your in your eyes? And I'm not expecting an answer. I'm just throwing that out as a hypothetical. Because those are the kinds of things that I'd be concerned about. Um, you know, if I'm if we're if we're just kind of opening up that whole that whole Pandora's box of well, what do you accept and what don't you accept, kind of a thing. So it's kind of be, you know, it's like do you accept any degree at all, or are we going to limit it to only certain degrees? And I don't know how to answer that. Right? That that is the question. Do you mind, Mark? Oh, please okay. go ahead. Whatever we want to do on degree types has to be specified in our regulations. Staff cannot be empowered to do an in-house analysis on every degree type. We see environmental sciences, geology, and <coughs> approve some and disapprove others. Otherwise, otherwise you have what's called an under, underground regulation. Any standard of general application needs to be codified in our regulations. Okay. Um, I'd like to see us have a special meeting for this topic because I'm very interested in exploring and hearing from a variety of professionals and non-professionals about barriers to entry in addition to the education requirement. And I'd like to explore a, uh, a, a sole you know, a work option, just the experience option again, like we had once before. But I feel like I'm not at a spot where I've heard enough from the industry, and the industry on the whole, the, whole, the contractors too, to give input as to what the current feeling is. So I'm not in a position right now to push something forward. Okay. Well, I, you know, it seems like we, we're having a good discussion here. I did want to see if anyone else from the public wanted to speak. Yeah, I'd just kind of comment on a few things I've heard. I, um, <clears throat> I don't think you should consider competitiveness or exclusionary uh, competitiveness as a reason for your actions, it should be based on can you perform health safety welfare issues um, and whether or not some of those degrees can do that. And I also have heard that the, the test is the gateway that kind of the gold standard of competency. And I'm not sure that I agree with that as well. I think it's a combination of education and test taking. I know I agree that when I took the test, I was able to pass it fairly uh, well. Um, however, a co-taker who was a brilliant designer and had a degree in landscape architecture, I don't know if he ever did pass the test, to be honest with you. Doesn't mean he couldn't do the job and be confident at it, but I don't think eliminating the two just because we have a gold standard test is necessarily the only thing you need to consider. Um, I'm not sure an interior designer would know anything about grading and drainage and how to keep a patio safe or a swimming pool or um, all those other items that landscape architects can, can do. And I'm not comfortable telling myself that as a landscape architecture I can pick a area of geography that's the best to reduce flood. But I think the combination of test taking and experience should not be uh, minimize just because we're worried about competitiveness or entrance to the profession and uh, I'm certainly concerned about that but um, I think there are related degrees I think there are the colleges have done a good job of providing pathways for many uh, persons to get to a type of uh, environmental design ethic um, maybe landscape architecture uh, Often I have to explain myself of what I do to people. I call myself a landscape engineer. I'm a 
planner and architect and engineer and a landscape architect just because that's what we do. Those are specifically related degrees, however, and I think some of the other degrees I've heard uh, tossed out, English, <coughs> whatever, uh, that really becomes a complicated issue for you and starts crossing over into that competitiveness angle. Why are you reviewing these other degrees? Is it simply because you want to produce um, professionals who can design safely, or is it because we want to provide more professionals? And uh, I'm a little worried about that diminishing um, what I do. In my job as a public practitioner, um, I would have to consider somebody designing a public space who may not have any educational background in that in that type of profession. And it's, uh, you know, uh, I'm also an arborist. I did well on the test. Doesn't mean I consider myself an expert in arboriculture, but I did great on taking the test. So I just want to you know, point out that there's, there's, uh, shouldn't take that lightly. So thank you for the time. Any other comments? Sure. Uh, Sean Rohrbacher, as I mentioned before, a licensed landscape architect in the state of Nevada. And uh, I have a degree in parks and resource management, just as another example. And I run an office of, of eight, and we have projects all over Northern California. And I, uh, I'd like the community to think more about the experience um, criteria as being important, especially in considering the architect's board and, and them allowing just the experience um, to be able to test in the state. And, and the, it sounds like uh, engineering requirements are a little less stringent as well um, as in having a degree in the field to be able to test. And, it seems like the liability that architects and engineers um, encounter compared to landscape architects as well is even more um, of a potential burden, and, and they don't require the educational background. So I think that's something to consider as you move forward. Thank you. So, um, yes, I'm sorry. Last thing, Gretchen, you you mentioned that there were states, and I forget how many states you had mentioned that allowed related degrees. Can we find out what those related degrees are? I mean, is there... Like a comprehensive yeah, list of all list. the degrees that are... Well, I'm, I'm more concerned about the states that are saying that they allow related degrees. You know, by state, can we find out what those related degrees are? Just so we have I mean, if we're trying to give direction to staff as to, a, you know, something we can do to, for, to kind of help push this along a little bit, so that we can have a better idea. Because if we want to make a decision, I, I would not be able to make a decision today to, to be able to say, okay, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna accept some degrees but not others without knowing what degrees that we'd be willing to accept. Um, we absolutely can contact the other states and ask them what their related degrees are. One of the things we have run into is um, many of those states say, or a degree as approved by the board. They don't have them. They, Set, you know, set in regulation or in law, um, we have looked there, but some of them may, and so we can definitely start that. Okay. The other place we generally start at is what is Clark doing for the certificate? Um, if member services are experience only pathway, but what do they do as to other degrees? And there, there's no way we're going to capture everybody, so um, the process to gather input, if, if we go down that path, is going to be pretty comprehensive. I suppose theoretically we'd have to ask the schools what what else is out there, what are we not capturing. If, if that's the pathway you want to pursue, there, I mean, staff might be able to come up with different models to structure your um, your pathways, you know, depending on which methodology you go with it. There's theoretically the possibility that you'd still say accredited degree and then other, or you can break it down into 15 different pathways on the map. Regarding the Clark certificate, they avoid related degrees. They do experience only, and then any accredited bachelor's degree, and then uh, let's get our degree. So, that, that would be a model too. Okay. Yes. Uh, Doug, you had mentioned previously the process, and as I understand, we're going to have to we make a recommendation that then goes to the board on this on this type of issue, Correct. if we want to change something, 
and then they have to approve it to move it forward. Is there, my question is, is there an opportunity to get their input on this issue that we're looking at? So we have an idea of what they may be thinking, or is that a tough nut? Well, one way to look at it is you can kind of read the tea leaves by looking at the Architects Practice Act. Very flexible, multiple pathways. Multiple pathways. So my presumption would be if you are mirroring, replicating that, it's, it's going to do well before the board. So I, I, would, I don't think I'd be okay. as concerned with that part as I would getting input from affected parties, including right. schools, and right. et cetera, all the different stakeholders. Okay. Any other Additional comments? Okay, so do I need a motion to table this? Uh, I don't know that we need to table it per se. I think you want to provide us direction to, to for staff to hold a special meeting, workshop, whatever you want to call it, to gather input and then potentially, based upon that, identify a couple of different models for LETC. Um, okay, so um, let's see. Um, they'd like staff to have some type of workshop or public forum where we discuss um, education and training credits. Um, is this something that can be part of our next board meeting, or is this something that should, that should happen sooner? Or I'm, I'm just, uh, I'd like to get some feedback from people. Well, my uh, my vision would it would be separate and independent from the meeting, and that way it would inform our conversations at the meeting, and hopefully staff could use that information and, and craft something for you to consider and take action so we can move forward with I personally like to have it sooner. I'd like to get the information out and have the people ready ready to come and respond so that maybe at our next meeting we can take formal action. Okay. So does this require a subcommittee or a work task? I don't think so. It, it's more of a Gretchen, my view is it's more like a public comment session for regulation. Okay. So you don't need your governing body there, you're not voting, it's a it's a downvote. Right. Right. Okay. Right. I feel like I need that before I can move forward. Right. Okay. That's personally just what I need. Right. Okay. Um, what else do you need from us? I can't think of anything right now. I'm just trying to piece together a can we, would it be appropriate to talk about this in greater detail during this strategic meeting? Or no? Well, it depends. Usually, the solid is guiding that discussion right. to determine what your goals are for the next year. Okay. So, but this was one of our goals for last year. Right. I mean, that's why it's on your agenda today. You right. can continue talking. Yeah, you've got all the room you need to be able to discuss it here today. It sounds like you're just looking for more information. I mean, a potential motion would be something like direct staff to hold a public input forum um, to gather additional information with the goal of preparing you know, the best option or a couple of models for LEDC to vote upon at the next meeting. I don't know that they'd need to vote on language per se. Would that be? Um, you mean language of uh, regulatory? Regulatory language, yeah. <coughs> That's what you're looking to do ultimately. Yeah. You can. Uh, so it's the pleasure of the committee. If you want to be direct, you know, in the timelines, you, you want to be directing. You're either directing staff to bring you more information, more input, more, and those are, that's part of the reason why I would think that tomorrow's not helpful to you in that way, right? Because you're not getting more. Um, but if you're, and, and um, as you were alluding to earlier, I think of the more specific types of information you're looking for, the better, right? Because the more equipped you'll be, like if you were looking for specific, you know, types of, um, Related to, oh, yeah, um, related degrees and that kind of thing. Um, and then you also have the ability to say, we want to uh, guide, so we would like to see staff draft language that says this. It sounds like you're saying you're not ready for that. So, again, just the well, I, think, uh, I think what Mark was saying is that you know, it might be appropriate to have. Um, educators kind of weigh in on this, or did I miss yeah, it? I'm interested in educators weighing in. I'm interested in the industry, being contractors, designers. I'm interested in hearing from other landscape architects. I think, unfortunately, uh, many have not. This hasn't been on their radar. Yet, in my dis individual discussions with a lot of different people, from new graduates to seasoned 
landscape architects. There's a variety of opinion, strong opinion, on this issue. And many are confused that we're, we're talking about this. Well, yes, we are. Come to the meeting. So I feel compelled to give one opportunity to provide as much input as we can get um, to craft a direction and then move it forward. That's where I'm coming from. So uh, I can make a motion. Okay. It's not going to be extremely comprehensive. I have a question. Can I ask a question? Um, when that brings uh, information in regards to um, other educators, licensees, organizations, what they would want from this special forum that we're going to have, would you like staff to take that information as well as the information that we receive from the states on the type of degree that they accept and then come to you with what the public said as well as some options of language that we could that you could possibly yes. have? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you, so I don't have to wrap that into my motion. I I I'm moving that we direct staff to um, schedule, prepare, and execute a public forum to receive input on uh, potential changes to Section 2620, education and training credits, in that the forum is held before our next scheduled meeting. <laughs> That's my motion. All right, I'll second it. Public comment. On the motion. On the motion. Excuse me. I'll comment on that. Okay. I mean, I, I think, Jim Schubert again, I think workshops are great if you get a good turnout. If mm -hmm. you get a non representative turnout, you're going to get non representative comments. So if you're going to do a workshop, I suggest you make it as easy as possible for participants to be there. Make sure you explain the gravity of the topic and and uh, hopefully do it in a form that's accessible to the most people. Uh, and maybe you have to have more than one. Maybe you need one in the northern state, one in the southern state. Maybe it's really complicated to try to uh, rally uh, you know, people who should be at these hearings. So, um, but at the same time, it adds more time. So you're not getting where to go. But I can totally understand your need to get more information. That's my comment. I would just say as a member of the public, I'm in favor of the workshop also, but I would hesitate that it be in just an information collecting uh, format. Like the last hearing we had, it was simply a microphone. People were allowed to come in the room, give a statement, and leave. Uh, I don't think that would be very productive. I think that you could receive that information in a letter. I would think uh, a community you know, of our profession workshop where we talk about the issues and it's led by staff or perhaps a committee member would be more valuable. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. And we did public comments. So I think we're ready to vote. Mm -hmm. Roll call. Roll call. Andrew Bowden. Aye. Mark Truscott. Aye. Patricia Trollope. Aye. Three zero. So, um, okay. I need to do this. Okay. We'll uh, take our 30-minute lunch break. Oh, all right. Right. Twenty seven. So we're on agenda item H. Gretchen, you want to present this? I will. So, agenda item H is dealing with reciprocity requirements. Um, once again, and just as a brief summary, in December 2012, the Landscape Architects Technical Committee received a letter from someone who was seeking reciprocity in California. 
uh, but who did not have the education, had met the education requirements, so did not qualify. And as a result, the LAPC began talking about reciprocity issues. Um, once again, the primary issue is that we received numerous requests from people licensed in state where they didn't have a student as a doctor, nonetheless licensed in that state and practicing for quite some time. <clears throat> um, originally, staff researched reciprocity requirements in other states and found that 26 states accept any baccalaureate degree when combined with experience ranging from three to seven years, and 28 allow initial and reciprocal licensure on the basis of experience alone, with an average of eight years required. At its February 10th, 2015 meeting, and I should say that um, over the next several years, the LAPC reviewed reciprocity requirements from other states and have been discussing this issue for quite some time. At, at the February 10th, 2015 meeting, um, we once again discussed the data presented and considered the fact that we California has a six-year training and experience requirement. Um, and the, the committee recommended at this meeting that even though a candidate with with a licensure in other states might not have the same education requirements as California, a substantial number of years of experience would substitute for that education. That license practice would give you, after um, a few years, equivalent training to what you would have gotten in college. Um, so at that meeting, the committee recommended that we base our reciprocity requirements kind of mirroring New York and Arizona. And the committee suggested a regulatory amendment to allow reciprocity to individuals who may not meet California's education requirement, but who are licensed in another jurisdiction of the current license, have 10 years of practice experience, and have passed the CSE. Um, when we drafted the language, we actually said you need to have 10 out of the last 15 years um, <clears throat> of practice. The, regulate, the regulation was drafted, it was approved by the board, and it was published, and during the public comment period, we received 296 comments um, expressing concern that the that 10 years of license experience was excessive, essentially. Um, at the meeting, um, <clears throat> language was actually presented to the committee, and I'm going to read that here. Um, the proposed language that was submitted by a member of the audience was that the, the candidate possesses education and experience equivalent to that required of California applicants at the time of application, or the candidate holds a valid license of registration in good standing, possesses a bachelor's degree from a recognized accredited institution, and has been practicing or offering professional services for at least two of the last five years, or the candidate holds a valid license of registration in good standing, and has been practicing or offering professional services for at least six of the last 10 years. <clears throat> At the November 4, 2016 meeting, the LHC um, listened to the members of the audience and after discussion decided to agendize this topic for the next meeting um, to give them time to consider all of the comments and determine whether or not changes to the proposed language are needed. Subsequent to the November 4th meeting, um, staff verified that both Arizona and New York accept any baccalaureate degree combined with additional years of experience for initial license and reciprocity candidates, and also accept 10 years of licensed experience in lieu of meeting examination requirements. <clears throat> so today's meeting, we're going to continue this discussion. Um, we have provided more research and more documentation on what other states require as well as what the CLARB standards for eligibility for CLARB certification are. And today we ask the Landscape Architects Technical Committee to consider the information presented and determine if any changes are needed to the proposed regulatory language. Okay, um, so the, um, the Terminology as it, as it stands right now is um, is on um, the first page. Is that correct? 
can you can you um I just you know I think we need to the of, language that's that's on the table right now? Yes. that we saw last time though, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so now staff we're... so staff is not prepared what the new language might be? No, we need the Direction. committee needs to discuss today whether or not you want to go with this language, whether or not you feel ten years is um, of license experience is maybe too much. Um, discuss your options. Okay, well yeah, go ahead. I have a question about the the language as it is right now, as it is right now without any addition. Um, I'm having a difficult time tying that back to an education requirement. What is on the books right now? It doesn't say that there's an education requirement. So how does that loop back and, and require someone who's licensed? Because when I read this, it says a candidate who is licensed as a landscape architect in the U.S. jurisdiction of Canadian province or Puerto Rico by having passed a written examination substantially equivalent in scope and subject matter required in California as determined by the board shall be eligible for licensure upon passing the California Supplemental Examination. But I, I don't see the loop back or the tie back to an education requirement. When I read that, if I'm licensed in another state, then I should be able to take the CSE and get my license. Am I oversimplifying that? I can answer that. Yeah. Um, uh, let's leave it to yeah. the committee. I am looking for okay. legal. Sorry. Sure. Yeah, sure. So I tend to agree that if you just read that way, that's, that appears to be the case. Is that a good thing? That is how I, I interpreted it when I first came back to but. I think you have to take this whole subsection and you have to start with A1, what is okay. the combination of education that. and trade? I don't think you can skip right down to um, C and then that's how I recall it being. Okay. <clears throat> because it's it's A, there's one, two, you know, one and two with, under A. Because of that relationship to A1, therefore, it does have that. Is that what has that, I'm understanding of that? Yeah, I think that seems to work. I would say it's a, I don't think it's totally out of bounds to say it's maybe a clunky layout. Yeah. But I think that yeah. appears to be the case because you're under a whole, uh, a whole regulation whose provisions are discussing uh, coming in. But it's also critical to note that 2615, uh, the authority for that comes from Business and Professions Code 5651, that requires education and experience. So, you know, I know I understand it, just the connections I are, know, it's, are confusing. Um, and, and so my next question is to Doug and how the architects do it, because they're again always looking how are the architects right. handling this situation? Is there, and there are a number of different ways. You know what structure the number is? I don't know exactly. Before we go to there, there's also 56, uh, Business and Professions Code 5651 um, says, it outlines what the examination is. Uh, it just says the, the board shall, by means of examination, ascertain the professional qualifications. The examination, then I'm going to. The exam shall consist of a written exam. Um, the written exam may be waived if the, if the person is currently licensed in another jurisdiction, has passed a written exam equivalent to that which is required in California at the time of application, and has submitted proof of job experience equivalent to that required of California applicants at the time of application. So <clears throat> that's what it ties back to. So you have to but there was the requirements of, that California applicants had to meet. But I didn't hear an education. I know. It's because I think 
because we use experience and training interchangeably. Our required our law is written that you have to have secure your training, which includes right. education and experience. It's it is confusing. And I guess the, the other thing that you know that says six years of experience, but then we have in here, you know, uh, professional services uh, for at least ten of the last fifteen years. So, you know, um, I guess I'm looking for some history on you know where where do we get the the ten years? Is that Arizona and New York? And why did we pick Arizona and New York? I'm just we pick Arizona and New York because they have similar licensing policies. <clears throat> licensing populations. Size and size. In size, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the 10 years was an average between, I believe Arizona requires 8, and New York requires 12, up to 12, and so 10 was the average. If I can add, um, it was 10 years uh, was actually specified in Arizona and New York when we start the order using one draft. Have a pathway that fits us 10 years uh, in the education experience and again. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, the last time um, our November 4th meeting, you know, we did have a pretty, pretty detailed discussion about mm -hmm. um, about this, and it, it seems that the um, you know, the issue that a lot of the board members have was the um, the 10 years over and above, you know, the experience that's needed in order to sit for the exam. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I'm wondering if board members have issues with other terminology or is that really the piece um, of terminology that um, is that still the relevant piece that we need to discuss in greater detail? I, I think the 10 years is, is in retrospect now, is uh, excessive than what, what is really needed. And again, coming back to our discussion, when we're talking about initial licensure and looking at related degrees, or if we would take a look at related degrees, and we were saying then um, that the tax was the gatekeeper. Um, so I would recommend that we take a look at what, it, what has been suggested that um, basically parroting exactly what is written here, the candidate possesses education and experience equivalent to that required of California applicants at the time of application, or candidate holds a valid, valid license or registration in good standing, possesses a bachelor's degree from a recognized accredited institution, and has been practicing or offering professional services for at least two of the last five years. I'll leave that the last part out of it just for a second. So I would I would say two out of the last five years versus ten out of the last fifteen. Does that mean post licensure experience under the license from the other state? Yes. So I mean this is basically somebody who already has a license in another jurisdiction seeking reciprocity back to California. Um, so that if they don't have, uh, if they have a degree, that it's not in a park district. So it's not meeting our, doesn't meet specifically our education requirement. So we're going to say you have to work in your jurisdiction for two out of the last five years, and then you can sit for the CSE. Yeah. That makes sense. It makes sense. Um, I don't know that it's equitable for your in-state candidates um, that can't. Well, we haven't made a determination on it. But to make the determination on this before you make the determination on the other, make sure you keep that equitable or balance to, there. Yeah, they have to be tied together. So yeah. At least your logic can make a yeah. decision on the problem. But that was an important clarification because, I, I know for the architect's board, um, if you're talking practice experience, that of course means license and practice experience <coughs> under that license in the state that you license. Otherwise, you're practicing illegally. And and you're saying 
not also allow under the direct supervision of the licensee. It has to be post licensure experience under your own firm practice, right? right? Why can't you gain professional practice experience under the direct supervision of another? I didn't hear the first part. Uh, we'll open it to public comment. Um, but I, you know, I'd like the board members to. Yeah. I'm after all, all the deliberation. My interest is to um, to streamline it so that licensing from another state. <laughs> From what I've seen with the architects board, they hired the NPARB. That's one path. NPARB's one path is with the NPARB certificate. So, from my perspective, licensing with a CLARB certificate <coughs> should, should just simply be able to take the CSE. You know, I'd mm -hmm. like to simplify and clean it up. And that's why I was asking about how this language ties back to the education. I just wanted to make that and now I understand better the way that it lays out. So my interest is to make it simple. So, Vicki, um, this, this is, I'm getting, I'm kind of trying to piece this together. So if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying is we really need to kind of address the issue of education before we can address this. If, I'm sorry. No. If. It's our intention to provide a pathway that does not include it. Right. Well, even if it did, because they may be coming to you, if they're not meeting California requirements from that other state, they may be coming to California for licensure with a different educational background than what you allow for your in-state candidates. So, Yeah. Well, yeah. We have to go decide that we're going to postpone that discussion. Until they we kind get of go hand in hand, I think. Okay, I understand they kind of go hand in hand, but you know, we, we talked about this in November and we almost made a decision at that time. So I'm kind of surprised that I'm hearing now that we need to address the education issue. Yeah. At that time, though, I had motion to proceed forward with staff recommendation, which held all the educational requirements in place as yes. they were. Absolutely. So it was just pushing this forward at that time. Mm -hmm. So right now, as I understand, we're kind of ripping it apart a little bit, and by doing so, we have to address the education, or else we have an unfair scenario. And also, if I may chime in to um, comment on the unfair, you, you're speaking to this disparity, but in the broader sense, what that has to do with is, your, it's not about fairness as they enter the, the marketplace or competitiveness, it has to do with the health, safety, and welfare of those that, the, of the consumers. So in other words, it's the same standard for any practitioner. That's why we're saying. So are, are we saying that we're not able to make a motion on this? No, you can. I just wanted to point that out. Oh. That the, what's before you, that it's a possible recommendation, what that does with your other decision for the initial licensure requirements. It's only different. <clears throat> One thing, though, I'm just thinking out loud. If you have a requirement that they practiced in their jurisdiction for two to four years, let's, let's say. We, I know we had the discussion before that license practice where you're actually out there on your own. <clears throat> You get a lot of education from that, and so that would substitute for <coughs> the not being a one-year, the minimum one-year education requirement that we have in California. Whereas, if you're talking about education for initial license, per, initial licensure purposes, that person has never proven yet that they're knowledgeable enough to practice safely. Whereas, if you have somebody that's like has been licensed, been practicing in their jurisdiction, proven that they're competent to practice safely. A little bit of a different issue than the initial. That's what I would yeah. Yeah. And also, they're taking and passing the supplemental exam, so a further validation of confidence. <laughs> but, Rebecca, a question to you. If I'm licensed in Nevada, I don't have a degree in landscape architecture. I practiced there for two out of four years, and then I apply. Is that still what you had just talked about? <clears throat> 
thinking welfare, not the same. Let me clarify. I yeah, wasn't trying. No, it's okay. But I wasn't trying to make any um, qualifications or or just, or, uh, or I wasn't trying to say that one has more than the other. That's a policy call. That's for you guys as practitioners to determine. You know what the an appropriate level to protect the public. All I'm saying is, as you make those determinations, it's less about fairness because that was. I think an easy shorthand for, for explaining the, the disparity, but it's not about fairness about coming into the profession, it's about the standard for which the consumers uh, have their uh, have practitioners in the field. So I'm not speaking to the policy or the weight of which is more helpful and what's sufficient for, for that okay. to be met. Okay. You might find that it's met in a variety of different ways, just like all these other pathways to life. Right. Okay. So, um, okay, so that you know we need to also be considering the, the education aspect and and we have already made some decisions on what we're doing um, with uh, with that issue uh, we're going to have this uh, public forum to discuss it in greater detail um, so you know I I don't feel like we're necessarily neglecting that aspect of it um, you know but I do think that, um, you know, as a board, we need to we need to make a decision. We, you know, this is this has been discussed for quite a while, and um, you know, it seemed like the, the last meeting we had that um, we were, you know, um, moving in the direction of, of making a, a change to that um, that one aspect of the um, the code. So, uh, you know, can we move forward with a motion? Well, I guess my question to verify, I think I know the answer is um, since we're about consumer protection, health, safety, and welfare, Rebecca, this is going to be for you. So is it, <clears throat> is it reasonable or is it a possibility to have a slightly different reciprocity standard than you do for a nursal licensure and the public is still protected? I mean, do they have to mirror each other 100%, or could they be? No, of course not. You've got the in the statutory and the regulatory process to incorporate whatever it is that you're actually seeking. I think in both those processes, but in for your terms, the regulatory process, it builds in the question: How does this achieve what you are are intending? How does this? How does this? Um, how can this not be helped by any other reg or any other? Um, aspect of what's already in place. So you can, again, as, as I mentioned with pathways, you can approach things with a variety of methods. I, I think maybe, I don't want to put words in your mouth, I think maybe what Vicki was getting at was being cohesive and making sure to take into account what, what the variation is. But if you have a reason for that variation and you can substantiate it, then you go from there. Right, and so in, in my logic, given the importance of portability, the reports I referenced earlier, I think it might be um, an option and something you could justify to have a slightly more flexible reciprocity standard since those individuals have demonstrated confidence already through taking and passing the national exam, but still have to take the supplements. And given that, I think it, it may not be ideal if they don't mirror each other 100%, and maybe they will ultimately, but for now, I think an approach, a reasonable approach, might be to have a slightly more flexible standard since they've already passed a national exam. <coughs> so my interest is to disengage the, what I read that comes from what is currently on the books from A1 where it ties it to this, this, the education and training experience so that a candidate who is licensed as a landscape architect in U.S. jurisdiction, Canadian province, or Puerto Rico by having passed a written examination of suspension of equivalent in scope and subject matter required in California as the German Motor Board shall also call for licensure upon passing the California supple, Supplemental Examination period. So, um, and to that end, the next paragraph talks about a not, not a licensed landscape architect. That both of those two disengage from the requirement of having to have the education. That's my interest at this point, having reviewed everything. 
So um, you're saying, just to clarify, if I may, you're saying you would like to see subsection C not make reference to or find a way that it does not incorporate education. It could disengage from A1. As I understand, A1 ties it to the education. Correct. Yeah, and we can break down why if it's helpful because I think that might guide what you're looking for because A1 says a candidate who uh, has these things may apply for the ALARE. And then it goes on to talk about different aspects of the ALARE. Uh, a can B is a candidate who's eligible for the CSE uh, once they do the LARE, and then C is saying all candidates um, shall pass. So, so I think if you're okay. if that's what you're getting at, I think w what you're then suggesting is to further narrow the pool of people you're talking about. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. I think it depends on it's separated, so it won't have the education. Exactly. I'm trying to separate C1 and C2. Well, C1 specifically. I'm not even getting C2. But C1, I'm looking to separate that so that, in essence, a licensee, someone who is licensed in another United States, can, can apply, take the CSE, they pass it, they'll be licensed in the state. Okay, I guess. Um the reason I'm talking about extricating a little bit here is because C talks about all candidates applying for licensure. So, right, I get it. Yeah, shall pass the LARE or something similar. Right. And the CSE, right? Right. But when it talks about passing the LARE, you've said above that you can't even take the LRE, LARE unless you have XYZ as in laid out, as laid out in A. Exactly. So, yeah, so, I'm trying to so yeah. right, exactly. So, it might take some more. Um, breaking down of the reg as a whole. You know what I mean? Some restructuring yeah. of no, I understand. Well, yeah. It's more complicated. And and that's my much, desire. I agree because it's a possible opportunity to really clean this up and get there. you're talking to about what is required. And I'll make a motion, but yeah, I'm sure, I would like to hear from others. I'd like to hear from others. Right. Sure. Okay. But Andy, didn't you make a motion? Well, I did originally. Okay. Uh, well, it wasn't so much a motion as more of a comment. It was basically accepting the first part of the language that is in our packet. Um, it basically, in essence, uh, took the tenure requirement, instead made it two years, two of the last five years rather than ten of the last fifteen years. And I was, I didn't have an issue with anything else that was in that. Uh, the one thing that is missing from the language that you were reading from him is <clears throat> the provision that it, that you practice in the jurisdiction in which right. you're licensed. Right. Because um, I can see people going to Nevada, circumventing the entire education process, just go to Nevada, get licensed, come here immediately, and start practicing here. So you really haven't demonstrated competent practice yet, but yet you're here in California now practicing. So I think it's kind of critical to leave practicing in your jurisdiction for, for yeah. whatever demonstrating confidence before you come here. Mm -hmm. I'll pick up from the public in the day. Okay. Okay. Hi, Buster Maxim again. Um, so when we first took a look at this issue from our perspective, um, one of the first things we wanted to look at was CLARP. And we thought that the CLARP certificate was actually a really good way to go because they've kind of already done the groundwork. They already have this system in place. And it's simply a matter of registering and verifying everything. And then you have this certificate, which you can transfer to other jurisdictions. And the engineers operate exactly the same way, and I believe there's a system for the architect. Um, and so initially, that was, you know, it seemed like a great solution to the problem. Um, Trish had explained to me that the, pro, the previous program manager um, that I guess there was an issue with the committee wanting to be a separate entity from CARB, CARB and not to depend on their certifications. But I do think that is the best solution if it's if it's an option because it simply removes you from having to decide how these specific criteria are met. Um, um, with regards to the uh, <coughs> issue of having to um, 
practice professionally out of state, um, in the previous discussions, you know, we kind of come to the conclusion that if you're practicing or offering services, well, how do you prove offering services? Do you have a business location in another state? If your company operates in both states, does that constitute offering? So if 80% of my work is done in California and 20% is done in Nevada, but I'm offering services in Nevada, is that acceptable? Um, so it gets a little bit unclear, and, and it was my understanding that um, working under a California licensed landscape architect, being licensed in another state would meet the professional practice requirement, as I discussed with Trish previously. Now again, that maybe that was incorrect, I don't know. Um, so, I guess I would just reiterate that this is a five-year process, and that I think last, so a year from November is when the first language was created or um, approved. And so I would say that that language was based on a precedent that is incorrect. And I think we've established that, and I think everybody's agreement that that precedent is incorrect because those tenure requirements of those states were intended to bring in the, the people that don't comply with everything else that they offer. So within those states, there's also other pathways. So I would say, you know, if we want to model ourselves after those states and after Texas or Nevada or wherever, we should also look at um, their additional pathways, which we've done a lot of research, staff has done a lot of research, and I do think that um, using a CLAR certificate would basically comply with all, all those issues. I mean, it would, it would satisfy the requirements of all the other states, nearly all the other states, and it would satisfy California's requirements, and it would um, meet the intent of what, of what you're trying to do, which is to allow um, people who are qualified, pass the national exam, exam or license in their state, and want to work in California. Um, and I would just add to this discussion that the, the public is in support of this. I mean, we did a lot of groundwork. We have 300 letters nearly. Uh, um, and I would just say that they, the public is disenfranchised with this process so far and the length that it's taken. And we're the last two that came today because we're the only ones that you know, still are optimistic that something can happen without resorting to other avenues. And so I just want to encourage you to, to please make some sort of motion that's going to, to um, spur change today. I think today we have an opportunity to make history, and, and I encourage you to do so. Um, and I would just, just to throw on top of this, I would say, as I mentioned before, there are only 3,600 licensed California landscape architects on the roster, and I just checked the roster from December, and only uh, 3,100 of those reside in the state of California, and half of the current licensees were issued before 1997, so that means half of the current licensees were licensed under the LATC. Um, so with that being said, those people are nearing retirement. We have a huge slug of our licensure population is nearing retirement, and we're not going to be able to replace them. The schools are not turning out enough landscape architects. We don't have enough avenues to become a landscape architect in the state of California. We're going to have an incredible demand. We already have it. We were talking at lunch that we're unable to find people to hire. I mean, both of us manage other landscape architects, but that's the irony of it, is I'm managing licensed landscape architects, but I still can't stamp you know, a set of plans. But, but the demand is already there. We can't find people to hire. We're resorting to uh, headhunting other firms. And so this is an opportunity to fix that problem and to, um, it's an opportunity to uh, infuse the profession with other ideas, other talents and skills. And it makes sense to bring all those into the profession. So I encourage you to please act today and, and move forward. Thank you. 
Sean Rohrbacher, I'd like to express my support for Dustin's statements. And I have a question as well. I'm, when you look at the uh, proposed amendment to the language as it is now, uh, it appears that the, the, the 1D section where you, you're allowing the 10 to 15 years experience, uh, that's in lieu of the education. I thought that was already established, and it sounds like that's, that's not. Is that, is that true? So that was already decided in the past that the 10 to 15 years, or the 10 years experience in another state is without the education requirement. I think as to a decision, it was the committee directing staff to draft language for consideration. It's been explained to me that the education requirement also applies to the California Supplemental Exam and that Take the California Supplement Exam, you have to meet the education requirement plus have an additional year of experience. That's how it's written in 2620C training credits. Uh, so that's that's kind of the, the loophole there. That even though you need you know, you have the layer of past national exam to meet, to take the specific exam, you have to still meet that initial requirement. That's the way it is right now. And yeah, you, that's the you way have it is to, right Yeah, now. you have to meet the education requirements. So you are correct that that section, the second thing is in lieu of education. Okay. That part B. Okay. And then changing that to, say, you know, two years of the last five years would be pretty close to this language, but then there's concern of moving forward with that and, and, and then not allowing or then not requiring education yeah. Even though it's proposed to have been written this way, or having second thoughts about it, that was brought up. At the, at the time when, when the committee came up with the 10, there was a lot of discussion about how post licensure experience could equate to some educational credit. So, or you determine the 10 years. So, it's like they were trying to make a balance okay, how much work experience post licensure would equate to an educational credit. Okay. Um, any more discussion? Any more public comments? I can, I can make a quick observation. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like you're struggling with the term experience to mean it could be a good and bad experience. Both. You could work, have 10 years of terrible experience, or you could have two years of great experience. Ten years of doing one project a year, you can have two years of doing twenty projects a year. I don't know how <clears throat> you review that experience and how valid that statement is, but certainly in this case, it sounds like the experience is there. The super local. you know, California is a unique state. It's nothing like Arizona. Okay? So you could have ten years experience in Arizona and come and be on the slopey site and have no experience. At all. So I'm not trying to discount. The effort and the streamlining, I think it's great. But what I'm hearing though is we're also hearing that the LAR CLARB is hard to pass. So are we now diluting the layer? We're diluting the experience requirements. What are we? What's the end result? So it seems like, in fairness to California residents who are uh, trying to uh, be licensed in the educational path, then. We need to consider that as well, but I, I wouldn't want to be in your position. I'm sure you've thought about all these things, but I think I'm just trying to bring some objectivity to the subjective thing. And uh, you know, the state is unique, and uh, therefore it doesn't always compare uh, just because uh, statistically. So that's my statement. Yes. From my standpoint, I think what we're trying to do is it's not really. An, Question about experience. It's a it's a question about how can we give credit for education when somebody doesn't have the education. That's what we're trying to do. So uh, by saying that okay, if you have uh, or I, when I say you don't have an education, you don't have an education, you don't have a degree in landscape architecture. We're trying to provide a way of some for somebody who doesn't have a degree in landscape architecture who already holds a license in another jurisdiction be able to get them so that they can get reciprocity to California. That's the intent. So how we are managing that 
is by saying, okay, we're trying to equate some period of time, two years, 10 years, whatever number you want to stick in there, as being the equivalency of up to one year of education credit. That's all we're requiring, one year of education. So um, I think that the language that had been proposed, not, not the 10 years, but we said two out of the last five years, to me, that would be reasonable. Okay, because you have a degree, and we're not saying, I'm talking about people who have a degree in something outside of landscape architecture or art. In this case, geography, let's say. You have a degree in geography, so uh, we're trying to figure out, okay, how can we get you the one year credit for that? So what we're saying is, if you uh, work for two years, two out of the last five years, in your jurisdiction, that then we could then equate that to being equivalent to the one year of education. That's the intent, at least from my so I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. I, I think we need to keep it simple. And, uh, and you know, if I may, the only problem with the equating it to the Clark thing is that we don't control what Clark does. We have no, I mean, they could change their requirements tomorrow. And if we said, okay, well, uh, you know, that Clark certification is, certification is required, and they added some other feature to it that our candidates are never going to be able to achieve, then, you know, it's something beyond our control. I, I think it's something that we do want to be able to have control over. And even as I'm looking at the chart under reciprocity, it says there's a difference between CLARB certification required and accepts CLARB certification. Those are two two different things, in my mind. Anyway. So um, I think that we want to try and manage our own reciprocity candidates, give them the requirements they need to meet based on our criteria that's fair for everybody. Um, so again, I think the 10 years was overreaching, and I would like to suggest again, uh, not to be the dead horse, but that we do it two out of the last five years. But you have, you have to have worked in your jurisdiction for two of the last five years. So, and then that, we, that equates to the one year of education. So that would mean somebody would have had to have performed the services of the landscape architect in their jurisdiction, dealing with, you know, all the issues in their jurisdiction. Um, you know, they, they they dealt with taxes, they dealt with labor issues, they dealt with all those types of things that uh, somebody working on their own would have to deal with. So they. And again, that's to me. We're trying to make we're trying to make it equitable for the one year of education that they've done. Um, because when we if we change it in the reg, we have to be able to justify how we came up with that. So I want to ask Courtney a question because she's done most of the research on this and been very knowledgeable. Sorry if I'm putting you on the spot. 